And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a couple newcomers to the temple. Coming to us stri coming to us all oh, coming to us from two different part two different parts of the globe simultaneously because we are worldwide up in here. <laughs> and the and we have we have two we have two developers straight from the new and improved revived Renegade Legion. In the blue corner we have Matt Alexander. And in the red corner we have Dale Ada. I'm hoping I got that pronounced right. Close enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good good enough for government work. How how are you two how are you two doing tonight? Or today? Very well. Too bad about well. yourself. I am do I am doing good I am doing good. Um It's unfortunately starting to starting to warm up. I'm already missing the winter as already. Um Although at the very least I got to, at the very least I got to laugh at some at some of the people in Houston and Dallas who didn't know how to handle a little bit of snow. Oh, we got that in Austin too. Nice few days and no heat, no electricity, and the whole rest of the Renegade Legion team wondering why I'm not doing my work in the meantime. <laughs> <laughs> on one hand, I on one hand I feel bad for the people who had um a pl who had those sort of issues. On the other hand. For for my entire life, I've had I've had I've had out of state friends in one form or another constantly needle me about the fact that I'm stuck in Minnesota. It's like, aha, you're stuck you're stuck up there in the cold, and, and now and now they, now they're whining about, oh, geez, how do you how do you live with this? Like, yeah, now you know how it feels. <laughs> <laughs> as as a as an East Coaster originally, I was more disappointed in the way my this my new state couldn't handle any of this than anything. <laughs> it's not the first time I've seen this kind of thing. I saw I, I saw um I saw um Georgia completely panic a few years ago over one inch of snow, and I'm like, really? I piss an inch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's crazy. And I, and I we don't quite have the same winters you guys do. We uh, we have very mild winters compared to those. Well, that well, that's because that's because one, that's because one, you're in upside down land, and two, <laughs> and two, um, well, at least you can count on the fact that that um, that old man winter is not one of the things in Australia that wants to kill you. Pretty much the only thing. <laughs> 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 Thank God for small favors, I suppose. Um, yeah, I've got I've got a buddy of mine down there who occasionally sends me wildlife photos, including some of the giant fuck off spiders. <laughs> oh, they live all around my house here. Like, we, you can go out at night and see you know, giant trapdoors and funnel webs jumping out and carrying on, and yeah, they're all over the place. We get them in the bathroom. <laughs> Matt occasionally posts up some of his photos of this stuff to uh to to our little like you know group in inside Budgie Smuggler. We're all like, no. No way. Nope. <laughs> yep. So, a bit of a a bit of a um, tradition around here, aside from the drinking, is to open with the humble beginnings, in a sense. So, with that in mind, I'm cur I'm curious about your first introduction to um to this sort to this sort of um board gaming slash war war gaming um. Form of form of ins form of insanity and ge and geekdom, and wh and what was the what made it stick? That's easy enough to do. Do you want to go first, Dale, or do you want me to lead off and make a fool of myself first? I figured your history is going to be both longer and more interesting. So why don't you go first? <laughs> Crazy. Um, I was um, yeah, I was one of those kids who was lost in my own head all the time so you know didn't really fit in with a lot of the other kids at school and, and I was off at boarding school for a couple of years not far from where I live now and there was uh those the old uh paperback fighting fantasy games um uh, that choose your own adventure type stuff and there was also another uh, English uh RPG called Dragon Warriors which was a sort of grim dark medieval dark ages crossover type fantasy setting that really hooked me into RPGs very very early and not long after that, I found this exquisite um, 
Sen Goku era samurai board game, uh, which my parents got for my birthday after I stared at it in the windows for months. I'm guessing that and was um, Samurai Warriors, nowadays known as Ikusa. That's the one. Yes, yes. And it's I don't have a copy of it anymore. I'm... It was also called Shogun at one at one point in time. Yeah, yeah. That's what it was called in Australia. They called it Shogun mm -hmm. um, when it when it came out here. Uh, when I was I can't remember how old I was. I must have been ten or twelve. And from there, then I found uh, Warhammer 40,000 and on a school trip, guys were playing Battletech, so they got me into Battletech, which I followed religiously for years, uh, and got into other RPGs like uh, Rollmaster and GURPS and Dungeons and & Dragons, and yeah, you know what it's like, it's a slippery slope once you get hooked. Yeah, and um, sin since, and you, been... since you brought up Battletech, I, um, I, do, I do have to ask this question, did you ever, did, did you ever field a Steiner Scout Lance? Oh, I'm a Lyran fan, so all my lances are Steiner Scout lances. <laughs> no, 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 don't don't lie to me. There is no such thing as a Steiner Scout lance. <laughs> well, there is. It's uh, it's four Zeuses. I thought I thought it was four, I thought it was four Atlases. Oh, oh that's just a normal lance. <laughs> yeah, that's that's battle armor, I think, right? <laughs> yeah, commando is battle armor. Although, although yeah, I will, I will say this: there is, there is, um, there is nothing more humiliating to somebody than 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 finding a way to kick their ass using nothing but urban mechs. That is true, and I've had that happen to me. Um, I was lucky enough to be involved in the testing of some of the mechs for the current rec guide when I was working for Catalyst, the current rec guide series that came out. Oh, I got, that I got one urban mech. Yes, I got to take out the. Um, <laughs> I got to take out the the Dominator in its first ever run against uh, three or four urban mechs, and I, I got destroyed, and I was just a disgrace. <laughs> you have discreet, you have besmirched the good, the good, the good name. A, uh, everybody uh, laughs was, at the urban mech because it's basically a garbage can with legs. Yeah, but. You put you field them properly, and and um and they and they are death incarnate, um. And it's fun. It's funny that you mentioned drag that you mentioned um dragon warriors since that's one I don't he I don't hear about often. Um, up until up until a few years ago, I thought that dragon warriors was the UK's answer to A D and D. Now, more recent experiences have taught me that I was dead wrong. If anything was that, it was Merp, but. <laughs> that, but I don't. I don't know. Maybe maybe I've just, maybe I've just rolled the dice wrong on on that front. Um, and it's a good little system. Mm -hmm. It's being uh, when I was not being redesigned. The uh, Dave Morris is doing uh, a modern version of it called uh, Cobra. Uh, no, Jill Spider Wood. I think mm -hmm. Jill Spider. Uh, so he's he's um, taking a lot of the lessons he's learned over the last twenty thirty years and. Um, creating a new system for it while still being true to the the setting and the the, the way the old game played. So it's going to be really interesting to see what comes out of that. Oh yeah. Um, now Renegade Legion obviously has is a name that's been that that first came, that first came about in the in the early '90s. And if I recall correctly, it started out as a board game, then expanded onto other things. Um, SSI t had a hand in tr in bringing it into video games, but had the unfortunate luck of of always getting compared to Wing Commander, which there's no way you're winning that fight. <laughs> no. And uh, Renegade Legion was originally the, the the rule sets themselves were originally designed to be part of the Star Wars universe, um, but when West End got that, Fassa had to then repurpose them for for, for a different universe. And as a side note, it's interesting if you actually go into a lot of the original art that Sam Lewis did. So that you can find some of these like available for purchase still at Noble, uh, like Noble Knight and stuff. Some of the original art you'll find um, there's art with straight up Star Destroyers in it because it was supposed to be a Star Wars game, like not not something like a Star Destroyer, a Star Destroyer. Yeah, right in it. <laughs> <laughs> and nah, now I now. Uh... I will. I will admit that, given given the fact that the the um, beta opens up with saying in the seventy fifth century the galaxy is at war, which um, I don't know why, but when I saw that, I meet I immediately rewrote it in my head saying in the in the seventy fifth century there is only war. <laughs> <laughs> but given 
and the and it's very the Star Wars um comparisons is de are definitely pretty apt given how the two main the two main factions you have are the Union and the TOG the Terran Overlord um em um government. Yeah, and what what one thing that that came out of that the the old uh, Renegade Legion was that it was it was that very black and white. You had the, the evil Tog, which was the analog to the Empire, and then you had the plucky rebels on the mm -hmm. side, who you know, tiny band of freedom fighters trying to save the galaxy. And what we've done with Renegade Legion now is try to put a lot more grey into the story. So yes, you you have the Tog, but the Tog isn't at quite as mon monolithic as it was back in the nineties. The the Tog in Renegade Legion now is uh, a much more complex entity with a lot more. Um, it's not the the mustache twirling bad guy anymore. It has it to live in the Tog is a wonderful thing, but then the Tog also does horrible things as well to bring more people into the Tog. And then at the same time with the Union. Yes, they're fighting for their freedom against this huge uh, empire, but these realms and these alien species that make up the Union uh, have uh, their own deep-seated problems. Some of them are, uh, are sworn enemies with each other. They're, uh, they're spying on each other. They're more of a, an amalgam of people fighting to survive because they have to, kind of like the, the Greeks when the Persians invaded, not because they want to. So we're, we're looking at bringing a lot more subtlety into the... The dichotomy between the factions and the complexity within them so that it's not just that black and white good and bad on both sides we, yeah. we really want to make the universe a much richer ground for, for that kind of thinking yes but especially especially since um if you look if you look at a lot of um a lot of a lot of war games um there are very few that just have two factions even out of the box Yeah, my, my um, my early my earliest introductions when it came to when it came to BattleTech was um the was a lot of the stuff with the Succession Wars, and with and within those you have um you had you had the you had multiple factions. Of course you of course you had the you had the um houses, but 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 you but in between that you also had um, mercenary companies pirates all that all that kind of crazy stuff yeah and i think that's really important because to create a, a gaming universe today you want people to be able to identify with something that resonates with them and, and different things resonate with different people so within the tog uh, different ministries embrace aspects of old, old earth culture and express those uh so there's you know this this flowering of the the beauty of humanity from from all its aspects all across time and then on the other side, within the, the Union and the alien species, yeah, each faction within the Union is very distinct from the others. So you can you know, play a, a very straight faction or one that's you know, very, very complex and off the rails, depending on how you like to play and, and what elements of what factions appeal to you. So, yeah, we're very, very conscious of that when we're putting this together. Mm -hmm. oh. And, and hell, I'd say, I'd say that's something that um, Games Workshop is getting a lot of criticism for because they've been spending way too much time on Space Marines versus Chaos Space Marines. Yeah, it's it's interesting when you look at uh, big companies like that, and uh, you know, they find a very successful business model. But you know, tastes change over time. So how do you, you know, how do you move a monolithic monolithic entity like that to you know keep up with your, your customers' uh, interests and, and demands? It's, um, it's it can be a pretty hard line to tread. Especially time. when the last few times that they've tried to advance the story, whether it be through fantasy or forty k, um, it kind of blew up in their face. Yeah, you see that. I think you see that with most universes, though, when you know, people have been playing it for a long time and get comfortable with certain things. You know, you see it in BattleTech, you see it in Star Wars. Um, you now there are people who love er uh, different eras, different factions, and I think, I think the important thing when you do that is to you know say yes, we're moving forward, but we're not forgetting the past. You, know, you can still play there. You can still use your armies. You can still celebrate that aspect of the universe, but you know the new stories will be told here. Mm -hmm. And I think it's that. Part of my job in my day job is you know communicating some quite complex topics and you know some very um, very tense situations. So being able to communicate that you know it's okay to have these divergent um, loves and the divergent divergent light is it's okay. You can you can still play what you love, and if you love playing that way, all power to you. you know, we'd like to play this way, and we'd like that respect in return. So I think it's a it's a very nuanced conversation, and I think sometimes that nuance can get lost with it must be this or it must be that. 
Now, when when now given the given the fact that this is a the original now if I recall correctly the original Renegade Legion um, essentially closed its doors in ninety three I want to say and so uh, and given the fact that 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 was a setting that had multiple board games a role playing game and a f and a few video games. Um, when the decision was made to tr to try and re to try and revive this property, um, how how do you how do you approach it to make sure that um, it that one it can attract a new audience and two it um, doesn't end up stepping on the toes of the of the established one. Yeah, that's a good question. That's something that took us uh, and, and Josh did a lot of work on this. He's the uh, the other my, my business partner. Uh, one of the things, and I'm sure you're aware of this, but some of your listeners might not be how uh, intellectual property is managed. Um, you've got patents, uh, trademarks, and copyright. Most of us will never deal with patents in our in our life, usually. Uh, so with the trademarks and the, the, the copyright material, uh, we looked at both of those for, for a lot of universes or for, for a new universe. And when we looked at Renegade Legion, one of the issues with the intellectual property is that the old copyright got scattered when FASA closed its door. It wasn't all held in one place. And that makes it really difficult for anyone to revive the old Renegade Legion because there are different rights holders for different things. And if just one of them doesn't agree, you've got you've got problems. Or you could be paying out large sums in royalties over time. The trademarks are separate. So securing the trademarks, which we've gone through the, the, the proper channels and the, the, all the paperwork that that involves to secure those, trademarks only last for 10 years. Uh, it's the use it or lose it propositions where copyright lasts for, what is it, seven years plus the life of the author or something. Um, so trademarks are a much more flexible uh, aspect of IP law that, you know, if you haven't used it for 10 years, you know, someone else can come in and, and, and essentially pick it up and, and use that trademark. And since Renegade Legion is a, is a fondly remembered universe, um, we looked at those trademarks and went, yeah, they, they have some really good value to them. We then looked at the copyright and went, well, that's, you know, a, as a business risk, that is really not something you want to wade into. But at the same time, it's a universe that hasn't been developed in 30 years. It's been left at a, at a point. And so we made a really clear decision early that we wanted to respect some of the legacy of the games and the thinking that went into the old Renegade Legion. It was very innovative in some of its gaming systems. Uh, and so we wanted to create new games and a new canon that you know, was innovative as well and would be something new that people would get involved with and you know, carry those because... Yeah, we thought we were coming up with some good ideas before, but what Dale and Jordan did with the, the rules was just phenomenal. And it was that, that sort of innovation that we were looking for. Um, and so that, that's where we are now, creating this whole, whole new Renegade Legion. Uh, we've just put, you might have seen on, on Twitter, um, that we put out our call for writers as well. And it looks like our approach um, with how we're um, building this new this new universe and the the themes we want to touch on uh, is really resonating with people because we've been uh, absolutely flooded with really really high ca caliber and high quality uh, pitches for, for writing in the universe. So we're really pleased that that path we're taking for for innovation and creative storytelling in a really vibrant universe is, is resonating with people. And now that resonated with people thirty years ago as well. So it's those those core aspects that you look at a universe that we're, we're trying to bring those to the fore yeah now give now um given that and and obviously the um with something like that with something like this set up with centurion um it would it be fair of me to say that you that um this is mostly this is primarily going to focus on the um types of types of armaments that can happen with the various tanks on these on the uh, sides yes tanks infantry one thing that we've been really conscious about is making sure that our games integrate with each other mm -hmm. so yeah centurion will focus on tanks infantry ground support that kind of thing uh but we're releasing with centurion at the same time as Innovator, the role-playing game 
and you'll be able to translate your character really easily to the tabletop. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we're really conscious of how uh, Centurion will integrate with Interceptor, the um, space fighter air combat game. So that they, they play, you can play next to each table next to each other and have a, have a big battle, how that will translate up to Leviathan, the warship game. And then how all that translates up and, and reads back and forth with Legatus, the, the Solar System Conquest game. So, you know, essentially you could play all four games together over, you know, three or four months in this massive campaign where you get to use everything. And we're calling that our, our Renegade Integrated Gaming System because we're really conscious that we want people to be able to have really different experiences with each game, but also some of the underlying mechanics are common to them. So if you understand one, you can easily use, use the other without having to learn a whole new set of rules. Um, so yeah, you're correct there. The Centurion is the, the, the tanks and infantry, so we'll, we'll get that out first and then we'll move on to the other games. We had a bit of a fever dream going, why don't we try and do all five at once? But um, sanity prevailed. <laughs> yeah. And given, given that, given the fact that you're trying to have um, these different styles of play, each, each with um, shared mechanics, are, would, are each of these games going to be using the same, um, the same Control and ac control accuracy and um, pen and penetration dice. Yeah, so that's one of the things we've changed. And um, if we're going to step through the rules a bit, it'll actually be really interesting to talk about these these aspects and how then you know, we've updated them for the beta two. But yeah, so they'll all be using essentially that that similar mechanic, and we've we've vastly simplified it with the way that uh, Dale and Jordan made the the improvements to the the system. Um, but yeah, they'll, they'll, they'll be using the same dice, uh, the cards will be very similar, um, so the visual language from game to game will be consistent, and that's something Dale can probably talk on a lot better, because he's our visual language specialist, he's a, yeah. a genius at that. Well, that, that brings me to, that brings me to, to the, uh, dice, to the dice system that you guys ha you guys have. Um, now the first thing I do, fi I do find interesting is... You guys are instead of going for straight numbers. You guys are going for a symbol-based um, setup, and with an emphasis on um, die colors. With with, yes. um, with the different le with the different levels of um, of essen essentially difficulty. And what I'm cu what I'm curious about is is how is how that's is how that's going to go about. Aside from the fact that you guys are helping to kill off the lonely D12 meme. <laughs> uh, Dale, did you want to talk on that first? The, um, yeah, we can. Uh, we're into change world now. <laughs> <laughs> so one of our big changes was uh, streamlining all the different color dice down to just two. And thank God for Matt, because it was one of those things where I was like, it sure would be great if someone could make this work with math. And then I just kind of stared at Matt pointedly until it happened <laughs> because there was no way I would have been able to figure it out. Um, but one of the things that's happened is we've reduced those down to two and basically those two colors, if we can kind of shorthand them, the red dice are more accurate and are, have a better chance of guaranteeing a hit and the black dice do more damage. And the combinations of those two dice from weapon to weapon kind of change the properties of the weapon, as well as some like keywords that will, for example, allow you to reroll certain things if you do have a hit. Um, and that gives you kind of that better between that and range bands and number of times you can use the weapon. You start to get these very different personalities for a weapon from everything that feels like a, a short range, inaccurate, just real blaster that'll destroy something to a long range sniper to a medium range plinker, whatever you want to do. Mm -hmm. um, I yeah. probably wandered off topic already and did not answer the question. No, don't. <laughs> It's good I, what he I, said there. I am never under any illusion that I am that I am writing. So, I am doing some high highfalutin sort of sort of um show. <laughs> I I can get distracted easily because we've and I I think this might be change has been such a such a thing we spent so much time on. <laughs> It's interesting, though, with what you, you said there, Dale, and, and, and what Mildred was asking, and that originally when um, it was my fever dream to use you know, 20 dice out of the box, which is, and we got a lot of feedback on that saying, yeah, it's too many dice. And for all the guys in the team, they know that for my first pass on something, it's usually got more bells and whistles.
in order to give us that extra um, complexity and depth is to use those keywords. So with the, the range brackets we've got and the two sets of dice, there's 90 combinations there, which isn't too bad for a game at its start, but we're also thinking long term, you know, we want to keep this game in production, we want to release expansions, technology upgrades, things like that. So with the t every time we add a keyword, we add 90 more options to the game. So we've got you know, 20 keywords in playtesting at the moment, so there's 1,800 different options for us. So we have these very, very simple mechanics, you know, two types of dice with a couple of icons, a keyword, and suddenly you have this enormous complexity that's also really easy to understand. And so that's where the, the work of Dale and Jordan was really, really good in taking my, um, you know, little bit of a crazy brain dump to look for this, this, this not... Yeah, I can, I can definitely uh, get, I can definitely get that, um, and that does, that does bring me to, to, um, to how it's, how it's going to be, how it's going to be set up, um, because when I look at the, when I look at the unit cards, we have, we have this fascinating little, gr little graph with different, um, different, different types of colors and co and combinations, um. Given that you, given that you guys are simplifying from the original um, die system that you had, how it, how is that going to work when it comes to ranges, attacks, um, ammuni ammunition, and so on? Well, that's a good well, question, Doug. Have you got the the card there you could share, so he could the new card. I we might be able can. to share. It. And the first answer to that question is we murdered the chart. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> Actually, that, a little for, 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 for accessibility for people who might have issues discerning different colors as well. And, and with all our design we're doing now, we're really, really conscious about bringing that in. And that was one thing I hadn't considered initially, too. Uh, so, yeah, again, Dale's design, uh, Moxie really came in and, and helped us with that. But did you want to talk about that, Dale? Yeah, there's actually, and by the way, I, I would like to point out that um, Matt has oversold me in every way, so everything that comes f from this point forward will be a giant disappointment. Um, and also when Matt said things like, we needed to work on the statistical curves, he means he did. He actually did all of that horrible, grueling legwork and number crunching. <laughs> With or um, without cursing, you guys. Uh, I, I can only assume cursing the whole way. I, I would be... <laughs> no, it's actually a bit of a sick, happy place for me to just play around in spreadsheets with numbers. It's actually not a hard thing okay. for me. It's okay, now, actually... <laughs> now that I see, now that I see it, um, I can definitely say that I like this format that you've just shown me better because of the fact that it's because if um if you had if you had gone if you had gone full to full release with the card that you originally ha as you originally had it, I probably would have had to tear you guys a new asshole. Repeat. Yeah, I would have done it myself. <laughs> I would. I probably would. I probably would have had to. I probably would have had to storm in like like the like I'm the American version of Gordon Ramsay, just cursing out everybody. Oh yeah. Because the big pro the big problem that I had with that original chart was it was way too scrunched. And when when I think when I think of these things being on cards, I'm thinking. The size of a um, of something slightly larger than a Magic the Gathering card, and because of that, you've got, you've um the amount the amount of text that you can actually get away with is fairly limited, and that that's the reason why so many games that you that utilize some sort of card sort um set up set up will abstract as much as they can so that they can so they can get the most out of the limited space. And that chart was way too scrunched. Approved.
that. And I think Dale said he was, you know, terrified we were just going to reject it and say, no, this is how it has to be. All right, so going from top to bottom, a lot of this is going to be obvious from uh, anyone that plays any war game with a card basis, right? And that's yeah. a lot of them nowadays. Um, a stack card is a pretty, a pretty basic component for most of this stuff. So you have a point yeah. value, name of the unit, that little empty box on the right hand side is what we're going to put the uh, the un uh, the factional emblem. Mm -hmm. Easy peasy. Yeah. Below that, you're going to have a little diagram of the tank, and those four numbers are your armor value on facing. So you do have the tank itself is going to have a square base. Mm -hmm. and it's going to be divided into quadrants and each of those has a different armor value so that's going to kind of stack up against the penetration when something tries to hit it on the left hand bar we have movement and those four icons in the black white and gray mm -hmm. correspond to different movement templates um and a black is kind of like a tight turn a gray is a softer turn a white's a straight uh so you basically get to use these different things in different combinations and the different templates have different colors. So the hard turn has a black, a gray, and a white icon, meaning you could use one of your pips of any color on that one. And then it kind of goes from there. Mm -hmm. uh, they get easier to use. Below that, shield value. Below that, anti-infantry value. And that means, in this case, it's just a random example card. You're throwing two black dice, you're throwing two red dice versus infantry. And that's kind of like a cloud damage. So if you're anywhere within the basic infantry range of, I think it's range one, right, Matt? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Anywhere if you know, if you were within range one, it can throw that set of values at it once. There might be like a special unit with a keyword that's an anti infantry specialist that can throw it twice instead of once per turn, you know. Below that we have our keywords. So one of those might be a weapon uh, that'll say, you know, your main your main battle tank has a mass driver cannon. It'll say range five, throws two red dice or three black dice. Um, and maybe it'll have a, a special ability like a double tap. Or maybe if like Maybe if you hit the first time, you get a second hit for free, whatever it happens to be. Um, and then you can have other things too, other keywords in there like targeting, lo targeting locks, special evasion abilities, special recharge abilities, power distribution systems, which brings us over to the right-hand side. This is a cool little mechanic. So um, just to jump in there, yeah. Dale. Uh, one thing that you might have noticed too there with the anti-infantry, it's got that red, uh, then there's the red weapon keyword, the shields are in blue, uh, other keywords are purple. We've color-coded those things, so it's very easy to pick up. Yeah, that, yeah I wouldn't. Go ahead. That's, that's something that I'd, that's something that I'd noticed. So when it comes to the, when it comes to the um, third one with the, with the anti-infantry, so that's what you would roll whenever, whenever it's a case of tank versus infantry in this case. Yeah, correct. And I'm I'm and guessing have, that um, I'm guessing that there's a separate rule that you do when it comes to say tank versus tank. Correct. That'll correct. basically be you see where we have uh, that red box beneath it. That would be the sort of box where you'd put in. We actually this is very easy. It just Laura mips some text right now. Yeah. But that red box is where you'd put in um say for a main battle tank it'll say like 220 millimeter mass driver cannon mm -hmm. and that'll be the one you can use versus other regular units as opposed yeah. to just infantry all right and um the right hand side is pretty exciting um so this is a fun little mechanic it's a power distribution mechanic and what that is is you have little power tokens mm -hmm. and you can kind of move them around between these systems to get a bonus so you have four little tokens you get to move one per turn um and you can see the little bonus you get if you have two power tokens in the bank. So you see on the first one, which is movement, hey, I have two power tokens, I get an extra gray movement template. If you have two power tokens and shields, I have two, I get an extra shield, or I get an extra red dice for the attack on the bottom one. And that's a fun little way to, like, these are not small tanks. We're not talking about something the size of an Abrams. We're talking about a 100 to 150 ton tank in a lot of instances. These things act almost like small starships. They have subsystems. They have a crew, like a proper crew that has to manage this thing. And as a result, their their plant their power plant can't has to, you know, can be distributed all over this the system uh this ship, uh tank and you know, uh give it bonuses to various subsystems. Would you and say that's what that would you say that an average would you say that a um that one of these crewed tanks um, would be about would be about the size of a um, cruiser ship. No, not that big. 
You've got a photo there with a, a comparison to a six mil Abram, don't you? Or is it I, the, the, no. somewhere? <laughs> yeah, well, probably, um, so it'd be like imagine putting a um, maybe like a or well, a big rig semi trailer, maybe two of them next to a modern tank, that kind of scale. It's big, but not ridiculously so. And that's for the big heavies. It's a lot smaller. Yeah. Yeah, a main battle tank in this universe is about the size of like an atlas in the battle tech universe but bear in mind because it's not legged you actually have a pretty large hollow crew compartment instead oh, of just okay let me let me try let me try an example that is let that is less legged how what would be the size comparison between a main, main battle tank and a um like a, a land raider or fuck it a bane blade okay so i have i have some of the older plastic epic six mil minis um a main battle tank will probably be closer to a bane blade a medium tank is a little smaller than a land raider. Mm. A light tank uh, stacks up at about rhino slash predator slash actual Abram size. And a heavy battle tank will uh, significantly out. I haven't, I don't know the name of that heavy grav tank they've put out for the Space Marines. I think it's a Forge World release. I, I don't know the exact size of that, but if it's bigger than a Bane Blade, that's probably the size of our heaviest. Yeah. All right. I can, I can, um, I can certainly see that. Now, when it comes to when it comes to turn when it comes to turning, I've seen I've seen some games like say Wings of War have have specific um, turning templates in ter in terms of where you can move cards that you can use to represent how you move, um, whether it be a slight or a sharp turn. Is that something that you guys have when it comes to Cor when it comes to turning? Correct. And in addition, we have so we have basically movement templates to determine all of this stuff. And in addition to that, as a really fun wrinkle, um, those templates have little slots on them. And what those slots denote is that grav tanks can, you know, if you've ever played any game with like a hover tank, like the old battle tanks global assault on 64, <laughs> um, you can, I, that's, I know, a weird, an old reference. There was I was going to mention recoil, but nobody's played that but me. I haven't. Uh, you can skip out of control you got you got air brakes that's it you got air brakes and grav control you can lose control yeah. and if one of these things takes the wrong hit on your grav skids or your stabilizers um you go out of control and there are little notches on these templates that like you may be able to move a certain way on you you can choose your template still but guess what on the end of it your facing is all screwed up all of a sudden you're facing like 90 degrees off where you wanted to <laughs> and it just leads to this like turn of utter chaos if you're out of control which is a really fun kind of back and forth between you and your opponent and given given that when it comes to when it comes to um for lack of a better term tank on tank action um one of one one of my one of my fond memories when it comes when it comes to tanks is um is mess is messing around with scatter and also messing around with um hit and run tactics so Yes. A lot of people, a lot of people have the have the image with tanks of big, slow, heavy tend tend to be tend to be fielded into a certain position, but are not really are not are used more are used more as a um used more as a tactical measure re rather than a rather than a short term measure in terms of how. Oh no, baby, not these and tanks. <laughs> when it comes, so when would it be fair of me to say that when it comes to the, when it comes to the tanks in um, Renegade Legion, if somebody wanted to use tank formations that were that were built more on mobility and hit and run tactics rather than just rather than just sit and fire, they could reasonably do it. Yeah. Oh, so much so, so much so. So imagine this isn't so much like bringing your tank in to suppress infantry. This is like dogfighting tanks in a way. So our our base for the tanks will actually have a. It's got a little elevator stand on it. A um, a telescoping thing so you can actually change altitude and it gives you different benefits in the game mm -hmm. uh, we thought through some of the mechanics of this how do we make it feel like flying tanks on the field and not just like moving uh, a regular tank around the terrain and the other thing is too is like you said you know you you want you want the tanks to feel mobile so the design of the different units then is is going to really uh, un underpin that and through the prey testing we've had so far the different uh, types of tanks play very differently to each other the heavies in the main battles, they seem like they're these big monsters that, that won't have a problem on the battlefield. But once you get your light tanks out there moving very quickly using their shield stripping weapons, they can make fast passes past heavy tanks and drop their shields so that then your heavy tanks are hitting a, a moderate target instead of a hard target. Mm -hmm. And it's interplay and combination of your, you know, 
the, the big tanks and the infantry sort of holding the key position, your main battle tanks as your manoeuvre force, and then your medium and lights is essentially your light cavalry, like the old Hussars. Mm-hmm. Uh, they really have all these different elements to, fit, to fill, and it was getting to the point where we started stopped using artillery on the heavy tanks because we knew we had to get the lights because we didn't get them that our heavies were in such danger, and then do we use the mediums to support the lights or fight their other mediums or get in behind the heavies? And It started to get all this really deep tactical nuance to it, and that's what we want the tabletop. We don't want people just sitting and plinking. We want them getting out there and having fun. Yeah, and what's cool and flavorful and like very what keeps us very different from because let's be honest there's a lot of games that use uh that use movement path mechanics we have we have Gaslands, we have uh wings of war we have x-wing uh we have armada even legion there's tons of games that use these mechanics but what's what i find really fun about this is that the onus on a lot of those is just a normal fire arc but tanks are a 360 turret so how do you how to reward maneuverability and positioning and in this case it's the armor it's trying to get that rear shot because guess what? When you get your light tank into the rear arc uh, of an MBT, of a main battle tank, suddenly it's equalized. The front plate uh, of, a, of a light tank and the rear plate of a main battle tank probably around the same value in armor. So suddenly, just because you positioned your light tank really well, this, le- this playing field is leveled. Mm-hmm which is just such a nice little thing to play around with on the battlefield. And it makes those little zippy scoot, scooty fast tanks fun. <laughs> yeah. The reason why I wanted to focus on this particular angle of questioning is because given, given the, um, given, given how first impressions can go, I could easily see somebody, somebody assuming, okay, we're okay. We're just dealing with, we're just dealing with normal tanks, but in space, since as much as I like, as much as I like, um, Warhammer and, and similar approaches, they kind of have that. They kind of have that same mindset of doing rather conventional warfare tactics, just with just in space. Um, and the and the fact that you guys are using um, grav tanks as your as your bread and butter instead of instead of using more grounded uh, material. That was that was something I wanted to um, make clear. Now, speaking speaking of that, given how artillery was mentioned, um, this is this is where I this is where I come I come back to um, to some of the long range artillery tactics that I had, especially when I would have a forty k army whose prim- whose primary tactic was at the fir- at the first round just just pelt the far end with it with as with as much munition as possible and hope something hits. <laughs> and and we've, we've got a way to manage that too, and, that, and it's a really good point. Is that yeah. you know there, and that's getting back to those metal lists and, and trying to play the rules. Mm-hmm. The way we've managed that is you don't actually select artillery; you select your commander cards at the start of the game, mm-hmm. and each commander has three abilities. You know, it might be ECM specialist, uh, call in artillery, or you know, a maneuver specialist, or something like that. And you can choose to use one of those three abilities once during the game. And you might have two or three commanders depending on the size of your force. So yeah, you can call in the artillery, but this is you know you're you're one small part of you know this huge campaign with millions of people on the planet. You're not going to be the priority for every artillery strike. So when you call in your artillery, you're going to want to use it right when you need it, not just to carpet the p- table for as long as possible. And that's how we've looked at managing that sort of thing by using the commanders. They each come with their special powers. All commanders have the same value, but they just have a very different mix of skills. So, you know, you'll find commanders that suit the way you like to play. But using the commanders, uh, it's a use it or lose a power. So you use one of the powers, you lose all three for the rest of the game. So it's, you've really got to think through, okay, what am I going to use and when am I going to use it? Or am I going to have to save this card for later on because, you know, I know, you know Dale plays in a certain way, so do I need my artillery for the last round? Or you know, it, 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 help, it really forces players to think through how they're going to play, not just how do I bring the biggest number of the biggest toys to the table. And when when it comes to those commander powers, um, was, it a tr- was it a tricky thing to balance to make sure that since... You're only going to be able to use one power. It's one of three powers. It sounds like, um, to make sure that people that di- people didn't um, hoard it or get too conservative with use, but also make sh- make it so that that people want to use it. I think we're yeah. still continuing to find out the answer yeah. to that one, right? <laughs> yeah, we're trying to break a lot of these things. Some of them are quite simple, 
and then others are more nebulous. So as we work through the, the playtesting, and we'll actually be putting out a, a call test to actually build a, a more permanent and official playtest group as well shortly, which we're really looking forward to. But a lot of the playtesting we've done so far, yeah, that balancing, you think, yeah, I've got this balanced right and it works for 70% of the games and then there's that other 30% where you're like, oh, wow, okay, that caused absolute mayhem. We've got to tweak this a bit more. And that's what, what this whole process going through these betas is, is helping us iron out those wrinkles. Mm -hmm. And then if there's any we're not sure of, then, you know, they won't go into production with the Kickstarter, you know, we'll take those away to do more testing on or, or or jigging and then bring some other ones in that we know will work so yeah we're going through all that process at the moment to make sure that we don't have any uh game busting um capabilities in there for the commanders okay. and the truth is and i've heard this from a lot of people too like I, ash barker had a really good of girl like games had a really good um interview on this and the truth is you know there's no real thing as balance right there's a degree there you can balance as well as you can and we're going to try and do that and we're going to make that semblance of balance and we could play test for a million hours and the moment it comes out in the world, someone's going to break it. Yeah. <laughs> someone's going to come up with I a have, break I have, a that breaks everything. I have, I have argued that, um, I think, I think that people there, I've seen, um, I've, when it comes to the balance argument, especially in role playing games, I've seen two, um, large schools of thought and I don't, and I don't agree with either of them. One of them is that you need to make things as balanced as possible. So that nope, so that nobody um out so that nobody outshines too much, which is definitely true, but you got to make sure not to go too extreme and have everybody be the same because nobody's gonna play. On the other yep. hand, there's folks like John Wick who have this balance is unnecessary attitude that I think is swinging the pendulum too far the other way. I no agree. matter what, I... um, tech is going to get discovered in in your game. Um, yeah. Yeah. If you don't, if you don't know what I mean by tech, that's a term. That's a term I've seen um, get bandied about, especially in, um, especially in competitive video games, where it, where people found some sort of trick that the developers didn't account for. Hundred um, percent. Whether that be wave dashing in Smash or BXR in um, Halo Two, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, very much. So. It's interesting what you said about uh, John Wick there, and one of the things we're doing with Zenovita, our role playing game, is that we're we're setting up uh, Zenovita. So, like you said, there there is variation between the characters based on their professional skill set or the species mm -hmm. they come from, mm -hmm. but not to the point where it totally unbalances the game. But there'll be some sidebars within there that says, "Well, hey, if you like to play a John Wick style of game, if that's your thing, that's cool. This is how you can tweak our rules to do that." Or if you want to play a game where you're like those poor Marines in Aliens and you've got close to no hope of all getting out, okay, this is how you tweak the game to make it that much harder. So that you know, our core rule set will say, you know, "This is this is our RPG," but you know, if you want to go in those directions, yeah. this is how you do. Um, so we we give people the options to to play that way they want to play, but still have a core rule set that's the you know the the official way to play the game. I do want to clarify that I did not necessarily mean the Keanu Reeves character John Wick. <laughs> <laughs> um, I should I should have said that earlier. I mean I was referring to the uh, ga I was referring to the, the game, game designer. designer. Right? Yeah. And, uh, fair, um, I was uh, I was watching um, Point Break yesterday, <laughs> so that popped into my head. Yeah, oh, man. But when it when it comes when it comes to when it comes to some of the um, long range ordinance, um, are you guys planning on having rules for scatter? So we've yeah, we're looking at things like within the box set we've got just essentially your your base game yeah, mm -hmm. and then as part of what we're looking at for some of the stretch goals are adding in um, the things like the mission cards which will give you. Um, some balanced but some also asymmetric scenarios to play out where the victory points are balanced so even if you're the, the weak side you've got a, a chance of winning the mission no matter what there's different different opportunities there uh then adding in things like minefields and emplacements and uh artillery and things like that so um for the for interceptor the base rules we've got so far um for close air support you know, iron bombs and things like that yeah we have a, a very simple scatter mechanism um we haven't upgraded Interceptor fully into the new system from the original beta, um, but the 
essentially the uh, the scatter will be based off um, if your um, your red accuracy dice. Since they have more of the accuracy symbols, you uh, if you're, you're you're firing your artillery or your bomb, you can rely on those ones to get it close. And if you're not close using those, you know, it will scatter at a uh, based on the um, the range template. So a really simple mechanic. You know, if you roll the red dice and you might get three accuracy templates, well then you you come back three. Um, three steps on the, the the range template and that's where your your fire is falling so just really simple things like that we wouldn't have a, a um let's say we would go down uh, like the the harpoon level of detail for, for for that sort of thing all right and the, the hedging answer is we're looking at a lot of things um yeah. <laughs> and and the base the base set um is going to include not it includes you know, all of the core mechanics, obviously, but we look at a lot of things and, and some of them that come up are like even things like a sensor, a sensor lock package, right? That adds a little bit of complexity to the game. And we have a lot of discussions about like, OK, this adds something to the game. But for the person coming in on their first game, which is everyone buying the box set, the core set, right? Is this too much? Should we save that for one of the first expansions so that, you know, the person coming in gets to have a really good time? and learn the game and then get to incrementally add on these layers of complexity. So we, that's kind of the constant tension we have and the constant thing we're starting to, starting to figure out. And when it the that um that brings me to that brings me to something else. Now we've talked a fair bit about the kind of damage that can be that can be dished out, but I want I want to shift gears into the art of taking damage. Now I can infer yeah. that um, that initial volleys of damage are going to are going to be draining um, shields, but is it a, is it a case where she, where shields are hit points by an, by another name, or is is the damage system that you guys have going to um, going to allow for going to allow for some degree of recovery? So our damage system is actually pretty. One of the things that happened was we, we were looking at um, one of Matt's initial approaches. He had three levels to this game, and uh, they got basically more advanced. And we're talking a good a good analogy would be almost something like Alpha Strike versus Classic Battletech, right? Mm -hmm. So it gets a little more granular. You're getting a little bit more into the subsystems. And one of those things was kind of a nod to the way that some uh, weapons did different shapes of damage on a grid in the original Renegade Legion. And we looked at that for a long time. And at its core, what we realized is that, yes, in some ways, there's occasional times that choosing a different, um, like an AP round versus an HE round, if you know exactly where the round's going to hit, and there might be a tactical choice, but ultimately that shaped damage grid is really just an illusion of tactical, tactical complexity. And what it ultimately amounts to is a, it's a chart. It's a statistical probability chart. Um, and... I hate charts. <laughs> my, my goal in games is to never have a chart. Nothing to reference ever. You know, you have your you have your turn order, and then the rest of it, you're just playing the game. Note to um, sell, send him a copy of Rollmaster. Oh, my God. <laughs> you know, you know, I love it. <laughs> no, no, look, actually, let, let me um, let me raise you one. Oh, maybe, maybe around the holiday season, I'll send you a copy of Phoenix Command so you can get some perspective. <laughs> I mean, can it get any more crunchy than the original Interceptor for Renegade Legion with its giant flowchart of systems? Yes. <laughs> oh, have God. You never, have you never heard of Starfleet Battles? Oh, I mean, there you go. The ultimate Scantron. Um, <laughs> that's, that's the one. <laughs> yeah, Starfleet As, Battles. We were afraid you actually might start having fun. Yeah. As someone who like grew up with Scantron tests, it was like, my education has prepared me for this. <laughs> But like, so we looked at that and, and the thing we kind of realized was, you know, this is an illusion of, of choice and it's really just a statistical chart. Mm -hmm. So what we did, and this is the thing, this is something I'm, I'm pretty proud of our team for coming up with, is it's when you do damage, um, as you saw, there's different armor facings. So the thing you're doing is you're seeing, do I get through the shields mm -hmm. by adding together your hits on your dice, right? And you're adding basically your accuracy icons. Like, do I get through the shields? Yes, I do. Okay, so now I can start looking at my hit icons. So I look at my hit icons, and then I go through my armor, and I deduct those, and I go, okay, I still have two hit icons left. Uh, I hit on the, the right side, for example. I have four armor there, five armor, whatever it was. I deduct, I have two left. 
So that's damage. And what damage is in this game, it means you draw two damage cards. So you draw two of those damage cards, and the damage cards are sectioned into quadrants as well. And that's statistically distributed throughout the deck. So in other words, if you go to the signs, you're going to have... Uh, am I right in saying the signs have more grab stabilizers, Matt? Grab stabilizers, crew compartments, things like that. Hit the back, yeah. your engines, and you know, things like that. Hit the front, you might get a no, no result or a weapon system, something like that. Yeah. So this is all statistically distributed. So you have like, it's basically like rolling a dice, but it's distributed throughout a deck instead. So you draw the card and you apply whatever the effect is on the section. And a lot of those are going to be no effect. Uh, a lot of those will say things like um, the tank's destroyed. You know, you hit the ammunition, you destroyed the engine, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, and some of them will have other effects. Like remember I talked about out of control and these tanks skidding. Guess what? Mm -hmm. This turn you're out of control. And then beyond that, the only other uh, thing is you have a damage token, and it's light damage. And if you take another light damage, you flip it to heavy damage. Um, if you take another light damage, you add that. But if you take another heavy, you end it destroyed. So it's basically a simple exponential progression of nothing, light damage, light turns to heavy, heavy turns to destroyed. And that's it. Beyond that, it's a basically a binary state with very minimal tracking. And the main thing product protecting you is uh, whether or not you have some sort of damage reduction system built in as one of your keywords, like uh, a, maybe a very super heavy tank or something with very advanced repair technology or nanotechnology would get to discard one of those damage cards per turn, you know, which means you need to focus the hell out of that tank to get it out of the game. And from a gameplay perspective, what this really means is very little tracking. Yeah. Now, and the dog. The nice thing about um, that damage deck is that, you know, in drawing four cards to use, you know, four different types of damage, mm -hmm. just in those four cards, you've got 8 million different possibilities. So you have this enormous depth in what can happen at any one moment, but it's coming out of a deck of cards that have just been cut into quarters. Look, no matter how, no matter what you end up doing, just don't pray to RN Jesus because RN Jesus does not save. I haven't heard that one. <laughs> Yeah, I've, <laughs> I I feel like putting that one on a T-shirt one of these days. In my in my defense, I was traumatized by RNG and XCOM. I'm but, not familiar then, as in, as in the as in the XCOM video games. You know, oh, the right, right. yes, yes, the infam the infamous thing of oh, you've got a ninety five percent chance of hitting, still miss. <laughs> okay, yeah, I get where you're going from. This too, right? Where you're like, I took a hit. And then that moment of ultimate tension where you have to flip that card over and you're like, please be a no effect, please be a no effect. And you know that just because of the way these tanks work, like you have a chance of no effect, you have a chance of it being some kind of minimal thing, and there is a chance your tank just gets an ammunition hit and there goes the whole thing right off the table. And every time you have to flip that card, you have that moment of tension of like, come on, come on, come on, come on. <laughs> We have we have a we have a uh, mantra we have a mantra here in the temple. The dice gods show no mercy. And yes, even if you're using cards, <laughs> and the card still gods too. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just use I just use dice as a catch-all in this case. It's ag yeah. again if again R and Jesus loves to loves to watch you suffer. Um, <laughs> now, uh, I quickly talk, there, I think I want to talk about. <laughs> how you guys are how you guys are handling um points because obviously this is still a war game so points are still going to be a factor now there are certain now a lot of games will have a preferred um point range um where lar larger point ranges can be done but they're not ideal they're not ideal for the st for the style of play for example mm -hmm. the red-headed stepchild of games workshop the lord of the rings strategy battle game doesn't really work all that all that well with 1000 point games you can do them it's just going to be slow and, and really really tedious um it ten, it tends to work with it tends to work best in the 500 to 700 point range so we've been playing with this a lot and one of the things we're doing is basically we're still kind of tuning it a bit but we now have a suggested point range and it's a mix of, yes, keeping the game going, uh, giving you enough to have fun for a decent amount of time, you know, up to that hour without getting crazy. But also there are physical constraints here because we're, you know, with things like range rulers and movement templates, if the table gets too crowded with too many minis, 
it becomes an unwieldy system to use. And I don't think I don't think anybody plans on playing um, Renegade Legion with Apocalypse tier to your armies anytime soon. No, and and if that's what they want to do, like that's there is you know Legatus is a l larger system wide battle, mm -hmm. and yeah, the thing that Matt is a crazy genius. He is a crazy, and I mean that on both tens. He is crazy, and he is a genius, and <laughs> he is at all times. When we are working on one system, Matt has the corollary systems starting to, he's starting to figure those out in parallel. So if we're working on a tank skirmish game, Matt is going, okay, my RP, the RPG over here, we're going to have more granular control because you're, you're now, a, you're not a tank. You're a person sitting in a tank. You're not a commander of a tank of, of a, of a platoon, a squad of tanks. You're not a tank. You're one person sitting in a platoon of tanks. So how does that interact with me? And he's also looking at, okay, what if I wanted to control about 20 tables worth of renegade lead, of centurion tanks at the same time? And that's, that is the sort of thinking that keeps us like just always ticking away on the next mm -hmm. thing. Um, and yeah, it, it, the nice thing is it also makes sure it guarantees that we future proof which is very important and that we're not working ourselves into a corner on any of these systems. Yeah. And a lot of that came from um, the, even though there was some really beautiful uh, mechanics and innovation in the old Renegade Legion, when you look at Centurion, for example, they were trying to be essentially a company level tactical war game, but the detail they put into it was a, 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 into each individual tank was more on the level of a squad level. Mm. So it made the games quite, complex and it's, it's something that uh, you know Battletech does a bit as well where Alpha Strike gets you into that company on company level really well where if you try and do that with say the, the total warfare rules it takes a hell of a lot longer so when we looked at this was well you know if we want to honor that old scale of you know company to battalion level the rules can only have so much crunch in them because once you get beyond that point you know you're starting to turn into a war in North Africa and you're just going to be there for six months trying to play the game and, and eventually starting a fight because that's how war for North Africa goes <laughs> exactly and so that's that's the approach we took to it so okay we've got it we can only do this much at centurion but then as we jump up to legatus okay now you're controlling whole armies but how do we display those armies with the same level of um a nice complexity that's easy to understand with again not bogging it down for a four-week game where you can conquer a solar system in an hour two hours and have a great amount of fun doing it but also use that as a as a base for a campaign game so you know we've got a really easy translatable mechanic where if you've invaded a, a, a world with X amount of force in uh, Legatus, we've got a way to translate that to Centurion. So you can fight that battle out with Centurion and bring the results back to your Legatus game. So we've been really, really conscious about how we tie all that together so where players go looking for different levels of play, they can find it and translate really easily between things. Now, when it, com when it comes to, when it comes to um, building the um, armies, is... I know that you guys are tr are trying to go for simplistic, but in a lot of um, in a lot of war games, you t there tends to be um, ways to mo ways to modify units, whether it be through war gear or s or similar advantages and um, sometimes disadvantages that a that add or subtract from the over from the overall point total. Is that something that you guys have been ki have been kicking around, or is or or is that something that just wouldn't fit? With us, uh, no, we've no, we've thought about that quite carefully. So the the way we want to approach it is is that um, each faction will have its general technology level, and uh, one of the things that the, the the cards once we advance further down the track will also display you know what level they're at. If they've got no number for that, they're at the standard level for that faction. So the card you're seeing there would be a, a standard you know, Union tank. And that if you want the more advanced models, you can only have so many of those in your force, so you can't stack your force with those more advanced models. And one of the things we want to do instead of just tacking equipment on, because we're conscious of table clutter as well. I love playing Armada, but you, know, you can you can have a lot of cards going on the table at, at one time, uh, and it's, there's a lot of stuff to follow and track. So what we want to do is, for example, one of the early stretch goals for Centurion will be adding more cards to the uh, the unit cards where they're advanced or less advanced models. So you can mix and match your force a bit uh, and have different capabilities in different tanks. Swap out a few keywords, you've still got the same hull, but it's doing a different job or it's slightly upgraded. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's how we're looking at approaching that, which also gives us a lot of ability to future-proof the game as well. 
and be really flexible about how we approach new technologies and new advancements so that we can integrate them into the game in a, in a nice consistent fashion that won't cause massive amounts of table clutter. Uh, so that's, yeah, that's a problem. It also lets us play with things like uh, named hero units, which is a super fun thing, you know? And as for like straight up modularity, like Matt said, we, and like I said earlier, like we're looking at a lot of things, but I, I think in the beginning, at least it's safest for us to do um, uh, from a, you know, from a, a meta and game balance perspective, the safest thing is to limit the limit stuff like that. So if you have an ammunition dependent weapon, like we can have different ammunition models. And this kind of limits our exposure to accidentally breaking the game by limiting those inter those modular interactions. Because again, we know we're gonna we know we're gonna mess up at some point. <laughs> but what we, what we can do is just try and you know keep that damage minimal uh, when it happens inevitably. Uh, so we don't have to. I mean, I am a giant fan of Fantasy Flight Games and X Wing, and they are they are wonderful wonderful game designers and it took them one wave to break the game uh two ways to break the game the millennium falcon all it took was a turret and the game was just they had to just completely change that and uh, bigs in wave one of x-wing and then the, the turret and the millennium falcon they created two game breaking mechanics almost instantly and again these are people who tested the ever loving hell out of this and you just can't predict it so some of this early stuff, we're looking to keep those interactions very simple, and it's always something we can add in later. I can, I can definitely uh, see, I can definitely see that. And li like I said earlier, when it came, when it came to balance, um, it's a, it's a tightrope walk between making sure that things are relatively balanced, so that, so that you don't have, you don't have one side um, or one tactic um, overshadowing everything else, but at the same time, you don't want everything to be. Um, the sa the same throughout because then what's the point of having um, factions? Totally, and that's the thing. Yeah. Right? We just got to do our due diligence and, and do our, the best we can, and and then eventually, yeah, someone's gonna break it, and we tried. <laughs> yeah. And we've been very conscious about how we we weight the, the different aspects of the, the various units in the game. And then at the same time, the nice thing about the, the keyword word system, it lets, and, and the other aspects of the card, it lets us have some really good factional flavor there. So the, you know, the, the, the union are technologically advanced. Their units are expensive to, to buy for the table in, in, in their, their points. They've got a lot of uh, lot of keywords that you can use. They're very flexible, whereas the Renegades, you know, they're scrappy. They don't have a lot of resources. They've got stripped down hulls. They're lightweight. They're fast. And then you've got the tog somewhere in the middle where they're that uh, the, the the strong hammer. They've got a, a few options. They're not as technologically advanced, but you know they they they're there to fight. Um, so it, so you, each faction really has its already has this 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 different way of playing it. But you can use all the different tactics within that faction depending on what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. And there'll be more factions beyond that eventually too. We've got now we're the the game's set in just one corner of this vast galaxy, which. We've actually mapped the entire galaxy. Um, we know where all the systems are, and the sectors, and the history. Told so you, it's crazy. <laughs> and as we grow out into that, we will bring in uh, more alien species, more human realms, uh, and, and and grow it over time. So you get all these different, really interesting new ways to play the game. That again, because of the the elegant work that Dale and Jordan did, that will still be based within that that system that helps everything stay balanced. And the other thing is to to speak of speak to like what you said about like trying to stride that like that tightrope between between balance and and you know just acknowledging the chaos we're walking into. I I myself giant fan of asymmetric warfare, mm -hmm. but not everyone is. So I I love a fun like almost RPG esque scenario for my tabletop like skirmish and tactical games, but. We got to do the best we can for the people who want to do that straight up competitive fight and like crush their best friend on a tabletop, make them and cry. Where, yeah, and that's where the mission cards come in. So you can play uh, essentially a death match, you know, three hundred point game against each other. The way we're setting up the mission cards, it says, you know, here's your mission. It might be an ambush, uh, and it might be that the defender has half as many points available as the attacker, but the attacker's only got to take out one or two targets to win. And we're balancing it that way. So you can have yeah, your balanced death matches, but then we've got this really cool deck that you can build your missions from that allow you to have those asymmetric battles uh, and, and complex mission um, 
all within one card. So you can have that sort of fun as well. So that's what we're looking at, trying to you know, service the different types of games. Oh, an escort mission, Matt. Everyone loves those in video games. <laughs> <laughs> I have nightmares of the old um, X-Wing game trying to escort the Imperial shuttles. Oh. <laughs> I think the only thing I hate more than escort missions is sewer levels. <laughs> Although, but if you don't like, if you don't get like sewer levels, you don't get to have any fun in The Witcher Three. You can't see it, but you can just feel the death stare, can't you? <laughs> <laughs> I've been playing a lot of Call of Duty Zombies lately, and that dark time, like the part where before the power is off in the dark, and it's just glowing eyes mobbing you, and I'm like, I I walk off those games crabby and tense, and my poor wife is like, did you have fun? And I'm like, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Although I, I, I think in that case, it depends on which Call of Duty you're playing. Uh, Black Ops this time. This is actually, uh, in the past year, is the first time I ever played Call of Duty games. I I guess I was a gaming snob, and I was all RTS, and I was like, first-person shooters are for, uh, like, I don't know, people with good reflexes, I guess? <laughs> and I gotta say, I'm really enjoying them. I'm not saying I'm good. I'm not. I'm just very much enjoying the stress relief of, uh, you know, of shooting a bunch of zombies. Have him play the Plutonia experiment. See how long he lasts. Oh, yeah? Okay, okay. <laughs> um, look, that's me being easy on you. I could have I could have had you play Blood. Oh, I am I am the worst casual of casuals when it comes to video games. When I play when I play Jedi Fallen Order, I set it on like story mode. The one that's like the enemies die when you look at them, and I'm like, great, I get to enjoy the scenery. Perfect. <laughs> um that's what I want to do here. <laughs> I I just look, I um I there are t there are two forms of there are two forms of GM. You on one hand you have the whole come with me, let's go on a magical adventure. And on the other hand you have I will break you. I happen to be both <laughs> at the same time. But when it comes to individual armies, now in the um, beta that I had seen, which um, apparent, which based on everything that's been said is um, out of date, it seems that a lot of obviously a lot of the focus is going to be on tank. But when it comes to when it comes to just infantry, when it comes to infantry units. Are they are they going to be a are they going to be a common occurrence? So it's not just um, tanks fighting tanks all the time. Yes, they will be. Yes, we've got uh, what we're calling jits and hits, which are the jump infantry troopers and the heavy infantry troopers. Then there's you know your standard bog standard old light infantry, which you know will be little more than speed bumps in this game, mm -hmm. but they do have a big part to play in the universe and the big garrison armies that the Tog have has. Um, and then there's all all sorts of other toys we, we we've got planned in the works, like you know, uh, minefields. And, and the minefields that uh, John thought up are just a, a piece of dark madness. They're they're going to be a lot of fun to play with. Um, there there will be yeah, the different types of infantry. Um, different alien species will have a big effect on the infantry. For example, um, Dale's favourite alien, the Atena. These are these are big bruises. So essentially, their light infantry acts like heavy infantry, and their heavy infantry is a bit of a horror show. Where oh, then you've so got House other Steiner. aliens. Sorry? So House, House Steiner. Steiner. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, just without the monocle and the caviar. Uh, and then there's, there's other species that will have other effects on, on the infantry. And that's where, you know, for the, the tabletop war game, that's where um, the alien species will really articulate out. Um, and we just had, there were just some, like, super fun thought. Like, I, I have the most love and respect for the person doing our, our art for the infantry and stuff. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we talked about earlier was one of the main races, the Olin is an aquatic race. It's like, what does that look like when they go onto a terrestrial battlefield? And then we're like, well, I guess they probably strap it up into a big exo suit. And like, and we thought about it and we're like, well, why would the exo suit have two legs? Why would they think two legs was a good idea? They're not bipeds. Three legs is way better than two. It's mo way more stable. So they're in the like, and then you imagine these kind of like tadpole like people, like a, like a, a little uh, an axolotl tadpole sort of thing, strapped up into this three legged strider along. It's just such cool imagery that comes out of the, the thought exercises. <laughs> and that that was one of the nice things with the alien species. We really we really delved deeply into the biology and the ecology of their world and what that would then mean for their culture and their technology and their development. So that when we take something like the Olin, who are the, the underwater species, to the 
to the tabletop, you go, oh, yeah, I get why that's that way. That's really cool. And then you can go and read about it in the law, uh, right down to things like how it affects language and architecture and all those sorts of things. And that then gets expressed in the art of the miniatures. All right. Now, you've met, you had mentioned that um, that you guys were building up to um, putting Centurion on Kickstarter. Do you have a date in mind as far as when that's going to be, or are you guys still kicking that around? We're, we're looking at 1st of June at the moment, and we're, we're quietly confident we'll hit that. And we'll be launching Kickst uh, on the Kickstarter the Centurion, the role-playing games innovated together. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, probably about four to six weeks out, we'll be launching our fiction anthology as well. We've got our call for writers out for that at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll have a fairly rapid turnaround on there, and we've had a, a really sensational response to that so far with some really great writers putting in pictures and, and lots of them. So we're, we're stoked about that. So the fiction's also going to be part of the Kickstarter too. So there's going to be something there for everyone, and for completionists like me, you can grab the whole lot. Um, so 1st of June is what we're looking at at the moment. Yeah, and I, I'll certainly be looking, for, looking forward to that when the, t when the time comes. With that said, I do want to sincerely thank both of you for taking the time out of your schedule and braving the hell of time zones to come all the way up to the temple and enjoy the madness at play here. Oh, not at all. We really appreciate thank you, it. Elder. Appreciate you having us. Yeah. And anytime you guys see fit to return to the temple, and I get the feeling that'll happen, uh, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> well, I didn't know the mantra. Next time I'll have a beer in hand for sure. <laughs> Don't twist my arm. I mean, <laughs> we well, really appreciate it. I'll be going next door to have a, uh, a uh, pig on the spit and a few beers this afternoon, which would just be terrible. But you know, if yourself or any of your, your listeners uh, who listen to this, and we thank them for doing that, have got any questions, we're pretty active on social media and we, we love having chats about this stuff and happy to answer anything for anyone at any time. Um, mm -hmm. We've got a good group like that where there's not um, not really any quiet people in this team. Yeah. And, yeah, it and depends of, on the day with me. <laughs> <laughs> and, of, and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>